Thank you for joining us for Sermons on Demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. We provide these videos as a way to share the pulpit messages and teachings offered at Friendship Grace Brethren Church. If you find these videos a helpful resource, please drop us a note at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com. Now open your Bibles and get ready to dig into the Word of God. As you can tell, we're still in the book of Acts. We will be for a, a little while. I think we're about halfway when I look at my notes. But I've, I've gotten busy again writing my stuff that I'm writing for what we're going to do afterwards. And so, because this is going faster than I anticipated it would. Okay, let's not do that. FriendshipGraceBrethren.com slash documents if you want to see the document, the study guide. And we're in the section on persecution of the church in Jerusalem. We started that last week. And we're in, uh, in the middle of chapter 12, beginning with chapter 12, verse 11. Now when Peter came to himself, he said, Now I am sure that the Lord has sent an angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. So Peter escapes from the, from the jail cell and is led by an angel out to the street. Okay, you remember how, how all of that happened? We looked at last week. Um, he was there chained between a couple of guards, and uh, the chains came off. The guards were asleep, and he uh, was able to be led right out to the city streets. Verse 12, when he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. In keeping with Luke's practice of introducing a character as a minor character first and then building him up uh, to a later portion, um, Luke introduces us to John Mark, who was part of Paul's first missionary journey, which is documented in later chapters. John Mark was the cousin of Barnabas. We know that from Colossians chapter 4, verse 10 the daughter of Mary, who was apparently a wealthy widow as she owned the house where the Jerusalem church was, uh, had a meeting place. And many believe that this place that is being referred to here is uh, also the upper room where the Last Supper um, took place, not da Vinci's painting, but uh, where, where uh, John chapter 13, 14, and so forth uh, take place, where Jesus had his Passover meal with the disciples before his arrest. There, there's, there's some hints that that is correct because we have, a, we have other record of, of John, of, of, a, of a young boy running out of that meeting who's identified as John Mark. And so you, you put, you know, it's all circumstantial, but yeah, there's nothing direct that says that. It's just what, what's believed based on the, on the circumstantial evidence. Verse 13, And when he knocked on the door uh, of the gateway, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. Recognizing Peter's voice in her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. They said to her, You're out of your mind, but she kept insisting that it was so, so they kept saying, it is his angel. But Peter continued knocking. When they had opened, they saw him and were amazed. But motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, tell these things to James and to the brothers. Then he departed and he went to another place. This is, this is uh, I think, showing some of Dr. Luke's uh, humor. And perhaps this is one of the most humorous uh, events in the book. Peter's knocking on the door to get in, and the girl recognizes him and is so amazed that she goes the other way. She doesn't unlock the door, doesn't let Peter in. I mean, he is now a fugitive from the law, right? He has just escaped prison. Could you kindly open the door so I can get in? But no, she's got to go tell everybody that Peter's at the door. Well, let him in. You can imagine what everybody's saying, right? 
Rhoda is so overwhelmed by seeing Peter that she doesn't open the door and the rest thought she was crazy. So here's a question. What does this tell us of the people uh, tell us of the people praying? So we know that they were together praying. We would believe that they're praying for Peter to get out of jail. Then all of a sudden Peter's out of jail. You're you're crazy. Yeah. They weren't believing with confidence that God would do something supernatural. They weren't believing that God would do anything. Really. So when Peter's there knocking on the door, yeah, no, that's not him. Can't be. Is that how we pray? Often it is, I think. What is it that we're supposed to envision when we pray? A God who is able to do even more than we can dream. But that didn't happen then, and I think that's probably true for most of us. It doesn't, we don't normally anticipate God actually is going to do what we're asking for him to do. And I just answered my own question. Is this like what happens today when we pray? Yep, I think it is. Yeah, yeah, we, we don't expect immediate answers. And I would, I would think from my own faithless prayers, I would think we don't really anticipate God to do much at all. Do you feel like that? I do, often. I want to be spiritual and say, well, I always expect God to do all sorts of great things. But that's not really how I feel most of the time. And I suspect most of us are that way. We're, we're afraid of being let down or something like that. Like God's going to let us down. Now when day came, there was no little disturbance among the soldiers on what had become of Peter. And after Herod searched for him and did not find him, he examined the sentries and ordered that they should be put to death. Then he went down from Judea to Caesarea and spent time there. So, Dr. Luke, in his infinite uh, ability to understate things, when day come, there was, or came, there was no little disturbance. In other words, there was a great big disturbance. There was... There was a lot of, uh, of trouble going on. You can imagine that the supervisors said, well, where is he? What you do with him? They, they couldn't say, well, we fell asleep and he walked out because that's a capital offense for a, for a Roman soldier. Oh, too far. And after they searched for him and did not find him, he examined the sentries and ordered that they should be put to death. I love the phrase, he examined the sentries. I get the sense from what Dr. Luke here is understating, that by examined, he's meaning he beat them. They were lashed with a whip or something like that. Exactly what happened? Tell me the truth. And then... He ordered that they be put to death, and he went down from Judea to Caesarea. Caesarea was really his capital. It was really the place along the seacoast, the Mediterranean, where he uh, spent most of his time. It was named after Caesar, Caesarea. With Peter's miraculous escape, several guards were executed by command of Herod since they had allowed Peter to escape. Following that, Peter went down to uh, Caesarea. Here's some pictures that I took of what is in, still in place in Caesarea. That is a Roman aqueduct that brought water from Mount Hermon down. There's a young Randy teaching. Um... 
this is one of the most fascinating places I've ever been to in, in my life. Because this was a, a Roman theater that had such engineering skills in it. You can see the different, the different colors of tiles in the floor. And in, in these blocks, there, I don't have a picture of, of one of them, but in these blocks here on the front, there are a few places where there are carved out, where there are holes. And if you stand in, one of those hole, in front of one of those holes, and somebody way on the other side, and we go back to this first picture where it's really where you really see how big it is, uh, you know, that gives you an idea how tall this, this really is, how massive that is. If you stand on the left side next to one of the holes and then you stand on the right side next to one of the holes, you can whisper and hear each other. It's really amazing. And on those floor tiles, there are areas where you can stand on one tile and everybody sitting in the stands can hear you and you can move over to the next tile and nobody can hear you. The acoustic engineering and that's all open. You know, it's not a reflection from the back or anything. The acoustic engineering is just amazing. And that the aqueduct is, uh, is one that, that ran all the way from the, the base of Mount Hermon, uh, a couple hundred miles, to down to Caesarea to bring them fresh, cool water all year long. long. And water was still flowing in that. That's right on the, sea, on the seashore in the Mediterranean. It's believed about 125,000 people lived in Caesarea at the time that Peter was there. So let's continue on. Any, any questions about the, the pictures? About uh, what, what you can still see in Caesarea today? Caesarea Maritima? There is a, just down from it, this, there is a, a port that was not only a port during the time of Jesus and time of the Roman Empire, but was also a crusader port. So during the period of the Crusades, uh, 1100 to 1400 AD, that was a, 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 a docking point for crusader ships. And the, the artifacts that they are bringing up from the bottom of the, uh, of the harbor are just fascinating. It's the, it is the uh, archaeological dig I'd like to be on because most of the dig is done with scuba. Anyway, now when Herod was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon and they came to him with one accord and having per persuaded Blastus, the king's chamberlain, they asked for peace because their country depended on the king's country for food. And an appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes, took his seat upon the throne and delivered an oration to them. And the people were shouting the voice of a God and not of a man. Immediately an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give God the glory and he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. The reason I spent so, many, so much time on these pictures, it's believed that he was in the middle of this theater at the time that he died. They would, they would set up a throne in the middle and the crowds would come. This was the only place in Caesarea that we know of at this point that was large enough to have a large gathering of people. So they set up his throne on the, uh, on the floor there in the background behind Randy. And there he, would, uh, he wouldn't have to speak real loud because it they would put him in a place where everybody could hear. And that's when the worms came in and the worms crawled out and he died. That is the story of, uh, of how Herod died. Um, Caesarea is, uh, is down here, in this, right here, Caesarea. There's another uh, crusader fort up here at Acco uh, Ptolemaeus. But this... This will uh, this introduces the uh, the second missionary journey, or first missionary journey of Paul, but Herod would stand would sit there in the middle of the, uh, the excuse me theater, and he would address the entire crowd, and it was the place that he was struck by an angel of the Lord DRT. Josephus the uh, Jewish 
turncoat Roman historian corroborates the, the account that, that Dr. Luke here tells of the death of Herod. But the word of the Lord increased and multiplied. The intention of Luke here is to juxtapose the result of persecution by Herod of the church and how that worked out for him and how it worked out for the church. So you have in, in the preceding verses, Herod's thinking about himself, I'm a great guy, everybody says so, boom, DRT. And yet the word then goes out. And as Dr. Luke puts it, the word of God increased and multiplied. So he was, he was comparing how that worked out for two different parties. So we go into Paul's first missionary journey which again is, is this, uh, this trip from, uh, well, his conversion and his early ministry where he goes on the road to Damascus and out into the Arabian desert and then down to, uh, to uh, Jerusalem and then ultimately up to, uh, up to Tarsus. Paul's first missionary journey. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had completed their service, bringing with them John, whose other name was Mark. What was the mission? They completed their service. What was the mission that Paul and Barnabas were on headed to Jerusalem? No. They were on a specific mission from Antioch. Exactly, taking the money. Remember there was a collection because there was a famine in the land and Jerusalem was the hardest hit and so they had taken up a collection and Paul and Barnabas were the ones appointed to, to bring the money to them. Pay, yeah, why didn't they? Now, the, just chapter 13, verse 1. Now there was in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas and Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Cyrene and Menaean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. What a group of leaders there. Luke, Luke provides for us the leadership that was in the church there in Antioch. Antioch was uh, quickly becoming a base of operations to the Gentile world. Jerusalem was still the mother church and the ecclesiastical authority, but Antioch became an important hub to the church missionary efforts to the Gentiles. The church leadership that's described here shows a true diversity of backgrounds. So you have Barnabas, who was a, a Jew from, from Cyprus, Simeon, who was called Niger, we believe probably because he was black. I mean, that's just the conclusion you, you have to draw. Lucius of Cyrene, which is when, uh, another island. Menaean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tet Tetrarch. So he was probably a Roman who had been involved in the royal family. And then you have Saul, who was a Pharisee turned Christian preacher. preacher. So quite a... Quite an, a, a, a group of, of people. So why would this diversity of backgrounds be important? Why did Dr. Luke spend a whole verse to, to tell us that information? Everybody's important, true. Yeah, I think so. I think it has to do with, the, with the, the fact that this church is both Gentile and Jew, of varying ethnic levels, uh, or ethnic groupings, of various uh, social economic levels, of all sorts of... It was, an, it was a, a group that had been put together of all sorts of people, ready to reach out to all sorts of people. It, it wasn't a... It wasn't a... a, a uh, uh, a small group of just one kind of person. It was a mixture that was ready to reach out to... Uh... Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. 
verse 2. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Luke's narrative here gives us the impression that while the leaders mentioned in verse 1 were serving God in Antioch, the Holy Spirit gave them direction to dedicate Barnabas and Saul to the work God had called them. Several times in the book of Acts, we see church leadership receiving direction from God in this fashion. What method, of Holy Spirit, what the, method the Holy Spirit utilized is not revealed, but they knew it was from God. So they're, they're there fellowshipping, praying, working together, and somehow the Holy Spirit gives them direction. Hey, Paul and Barnabas, they're a team, and I'm going to send them out. Separate them. Dedicate them. Uh, the, the, the way it's written, it could even be more like um, lay hands on them, dedicate them, and, and uh, send them out. Is that what message? Yeah. That, that's, that's reading a little into it, but it, the inference is there. Exactly. So the question is, is that any different than today? The mode would be different? So you're... you're yeah, but we don't know that he did that here. We just know that he communicated. Yeah. I think it's exactly like we have, we get direction how we, you know, how we dedicate people and, and, uh, and we, we get this, for example, my buddy Dave down in, in Golden Gate, if he's watching, he'll, he'll know now, but uh, if he's not, he won't, he doesn't know yet, but I'm asking God to use him to be a church planner down in Naples. He doesn't know that yet. I think that's this situation. I think the people, the leadership, the, the leadership that were just described there gathered around Paul and Barnabas and said, God is sending you out. God's impressed upon our heart in whatever method he did that to, uh, to be missionaries for him. Verse 3, then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia and from there sailed to Cyprus. It's believed that the uh, commissioning took place about 46 AD. It's difficult to say specifically, but we have some instruction by, some information by Dr. Luke. We have some information given... I get the hiccups again. Later by the Apostle Paul in Galatians. And so when we put everything together, it looks like about 46 uh, AD that this took place. Luke is very careful to ensure that his readers see that Saul and Barnabas were responding to the direction of the Holy Spirit. It was God who was leading the movement which uh, affected the growth of the church, not man. Seleucia is a port city in the upper coast of the Mediterranean Sea in modern Turkey. Cyprus is a small island in the Mediterranean Sea southwest of Seleucia, about 120 miles. In the Old Testament, this, old, or in the old Testament, this island was uh, known as Kittim in Gen uh, Genesis 10.4. It was also the home of Barnabas and some of the leaders who started uh, the church in Antioch. So Barnabas was taking his new partner, Saul, uh, home to, uh, to meet the home crowd. When they arrived at Sal uh, Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogue of the Jews, and they had John to assist them. Why did they preach the word of God in the Jewish synagogues?
Say that again. Okay. Yeah. Both answers are, are correct. Um, Kate said that's where everybody was. They were, they were First of all, they, they would go to the Jews first. It gave priority in that generation to the Jews receiving the gospel first, as we see in Paul say in Romans, as we will read later in, here in Acts in several places. Gentiles would come to the Jew first and then to the Gentiles was the idea. But Gentiles in the synagogue would be a fruitful field for showing the gospel because they would already be acquainted with the Old Testament and with the anticipation of the Messiah. That should be Jews in the synagogue, not Gentiles in the synagogue. Along with the Gentiles that would sit in the outer court of the synagogue uh, because they were interested in knowing more about who the Messiah was. We're also told in this verse that John Mark, Barnabas's cousin, was now working with him. The understanding of, uh, well, let me go back to this verse here. And they had John to assist them. The understanding of that word assist in its original is not sure. It normally means servant or assistant, but in what fashion John Mark assisted or served is debated. Some say he was too young to be of value as a teacher, but was the guy that was schlepping the bags. We don't, we don't know um, he, what role he had, but that, there's, there's question about what that word means since it's not, a, not a, a word that always means exactly the same thing. So we, we don't know what his role really was. Verse 6. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. We don't know how well the ministry went in Salamis, as Luke does not give us any specific information. In verse 6, they have traveled across the island to the city of Paphos, about 100 miles southwest of Salamis. It was the capital of the provincial government and was an important city on the island. In Paphos, they met Bar-Jesus, a Jewish false prophet and magician. Luke describes Bar-Jesus as, as, here is the word, just in case you could read that, Majon Pseudoprophetin. The definition of Majon is difficult and depends on context. Majon is the same root word as magi, um, as in the wise men in Jesus' birth narrative. It's also a description of a sorcerer, a magician, or someone that would be known as a witch or a warlock. Add to this description that Luke also says he's a pseudo or false prophet. This means he was not receiving information from God to give to others. When in combination with magi, it is clear he was receiving information from from Satan or demons. I should have given you both sides the transliteration as well. Sorry. So Dr. Luke makes it very clear. Bar Jesus is a bad guy who is receiving information from the underworld, from the spirit world, and not from God. And he's doing magic. Um, doing witchcraft, sorcery, that kinds of things. He was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence, who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word. I love this verse. Not only was Bar Jesus a false prophet, he was an also attendant to the proconsul Sergius Paulus. A proconsul was the governor of a Roman province appointed by the Senate for one year period of time. Apparently the proconsul was interested in what Paul, what Saul and Barnabas had to say and directed them to come to him. So he, he's listening to this false prophet 
pseudo prophetes, as, uh, as Dr. Luke would call him, the false prophet, bar Jesus, and now he has an opportunity to hear true prophets in Barnabas and Saul, and so he directed them to come to him and speak to him. But Elimus, the magician, for that is the meaning of his name, opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. He's fighting for his territory. I don't want you to go listen to them. I don't want you to hear them. Because they're going to tell you something that is not in keeping with what I've told you. Bar-Jesus, or Elimus, as his name was translated, did not want Sergius Paulus to come to a Christian faith and worked to prevent him, prevent him from it. So why would he object to Sergius Paulus coming, becoming a Christian? Why would, a, why would a guy who's in league with the devil object to someone becoming a Christian? I think so. <laughs> it's, it's certainly contraindicated, isn't it? it, it, it it's not going to help his cause. You know, here he is. He's, he's besties with the governor, so he probably has a light load. But if the governor all of a sudden turns to faith in Jesus, you know, he's going to be swept out with the trash. Yeah, he's not going to like that a lot. But Saul, who was also called Paul filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him. We have in this verse the first time Luke uses Paul in reference to Saul. So here's a question. What changed that Luke would begin to refer to Saul as Paul? There was no mystical thing that happened on the road to Damascus, and all of a sudden he's being called Paul. His name was changed by God to Paul. What happened? He's exactly right. He's called Saul when dealing with Jews because that is his Jewish name or the Jewish pronunciation of his name. He's called Paul when dealing with Gentiles because that's the Roman pronunciation of his name. I would prefer Richard, which is how you would say it in German. I'm not a Ricardo. No. <laughs> so, I don't know how many times and how many things I've, writ I've read about some mystical thing happened. But here, right in the middle of a passage... We see the transition from Saul to Paul without any mention of anything mystical. Nothing happened. His name always was Saul. His name always was Paul. Remember, he grew up as a Jew in a Gentile town. So his Jewish friends called him Saul and his Gentile friends called him Paul. No big deal. This is not an Abram Abraham moment. And Saul said, you son of the devil. Probably in, in uh, the way Paul said that, it was probably a little more demonstrative and uh, caused a little more concern. But you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of deceit and villainy. Love that, villainy. Will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? Paul lashed out at Bar-Jesus, who was actively trying to prevent the salvation of Sergius Paulus. Paul said that he was an enemy of righteousness. He also called him the son of the devil. Bar-Jesus means son of salvation. But he, Paul was calling him the son of the devil. Paul also told him to stop perverting the ways of the Lord. Being controlled or filled with demons, Bar-Jesus was on the opposite side from God. He was fighting in the power of Satan... To repel the power of God, Paul rebuked him. And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. Immediately mist and darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. 
Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Paul told Bar-Jesus that he would be blind for a period of time, and immediately he was blind. He no longer could get around without the aid of someone else. Verse 12 is an interesting verse. The proconsul believed because he was astonished by the teaching about the Lord. It was not the miracle of judgment on bar jesus it was the word of god that changed his heart this passage is significant for several reasons in the flow of the book of acts it's the point that paul is seen as the leader of the missionary effort luke refers to paul and his companions rather than barnabas and his companions this leads us to conclude that paul was leading from this point on the mission appears to be more more focused on gentiles We also see in the narrative the fact that the Jew was blinded, but the Gentile believed. It's an interesting step in the progression of what's going on in uh, the book of Acts. On to verse 13. Whoops, before we get there, let's look at at Paul's first missionary journey. Um, where they go and, and what happens. So, they remember, they started here in Antioch, and they went to Salamis, to Paphos, and then they go up into what is today, this is modern Turkey, and uh, they go up into uh, Persia, Pisidia, and uh, Antioch and Pisidia, Iconium, Derby, Lystra, and... Uh, Attila and back over to Antioch. That was the first journey that they're, they're, they're in the middle of now. Verse 13. Now Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Persia in Pamphylia, and John left them and returned to Jerusalem. So we have a, we have a difficult time beginning to happen within the, uh, within the team. Paul and Barnabas leave uh, uh, Cyprus and set sail north to Persia in modern Turkey. John Mark left them to return to Jerusalem, a fact that would provide the team with challenges in the future. When he left it is not specifically known. Many have speculated, but this does not provide any benefit to our study. Uh, we don't know what was going on. We don't know why he left. We don't know exactly how all of that transpired. But we do know from later on in the book of Acts that there was then a fight between Barnabas and Saul, Barnabas and Paul, when they wanted, when Barnabas wanted to take his cousin, let's give him another chance. No, I'm not doing it. He left us high and dry. You can imagine how these two A-type personalities are fighting about that. And, you know, we, we, for whatever reason, we typically think of Paul as, as a, as a, as a shorter guy. I don't, I don't really know why. But in, in drawings that are supposedly close to the period of time, you know, he's, he's kind of a short guy, and so he has to make up for that with a loud voice. And you can, you can, you can envision him, you know, with this loud voice against uh, Barnabas. No, he didn't help us, he hurt us. I'm not taking him, forget it. And they had the fight and they separated. That doesn't happen yet. They still go throughout this, uh, this journey. But John Mark has now left. So if he was the guy schlepping the bags, now they're schlepping their own bags. That's a bad day. But they went from Persia and came to Antioch and Pisidia, and on the Sabbath day they went into the synagogue and sat down. Um, Many scholars believe that they they didn't stay in Perga very long um, because Paul got sick. Many actually believe that he contracted malaria and traveled north to higher elevations to get into some cooler air to relieve the fever. When you look in the book of Galatians, you read, you know it was because of a bodily ailment that I preached the gospel to you at first. So what is believed to have happened, you know, they're, they're go back to this map, they're down by the seacoast, it's warmer, it's more humid, and, in, and Paul gets what we believe is malaria. And so he has to go up into the mountain. He's got a fever. 
It's not like they can put him in the cooler. You know, they don't have all the medicines and so forth. And so he goes to the higher elevations. And I can attest higher elevations are way colder. They have no air. And that was better for Paul. And so that is why the trip went the way it did. Because as they go north out of Persia into Pisidia and up into, into uh, Phrygia, they're, they're up into higher elevations where it's colder and uh, they have cool water and his treatment of his fever from malaria is able to, uh, to better happen. Verse 15. After the reading from the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them saying, Brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, say it. Paul's normal custom was first to go to the synagogues when they arrived in the new town. And so it, was the, it must have been the Sabbath as the uh, law of the pro- and prophets were read in the synagogue. And when the reading was complete, a message was sent to Paul and Barnabas asking if they had anything to tell them. So what an invitation, right? You've got two preachers just itching for an opportunity to, to share the gospel with a with a bunch of new people. And so Paul is given an opportunity to preach, and so he does. And so I have included very large sections here because I want to I want the message to stand together. So I'll read from chapter 13 verse 16 on to 25. So Paul stood up and motioning with his hand said, "Men of Israel, and you who fear God, Listen, so the men of Israel would be the Jews, and you who fear God would be the Gentiles in the outer court of the synagogue. Okay? So it was not uncommon in Gentile cities, <coughs> excuse me, for there to be Gentiles in the Jewish synagogue. They couldn't be in the main area. They had to be separated a little, but that's who Paul's addressing here. Uh, men of Israel, Jews, and you who fear God, Gentiles. Listen. The God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. And with uplifted arm, he led them out of it. And for about 40 years, he put up with them in the wilderness. And after destroying seven nations in the land of Canaan, he gave them their land as an inheritance. All this took about 450 years. And after that, he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. Then they asked for a king, and God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for forty years. And when he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, of whom he testified and said, I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, who will do all my will. After this man's offering, God has brought to Israel a savior, an offspring. God has brought to Israel a savior, Jesus, as he promised. Before his coming, John had proclaimed a baptism of repentance to all people of Israel. And as John was finishing his course, he said, What do you suppose that I am? I am not he. No, but behold, after me is one coming, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to untie. That's the beginning of, of the, the, the uh, message. Paul stands up to preach and preaches a high-altitude overview of the Old Testament of how Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament's Messiah passages. Paul then takes advantage of his audience, knowledge of the Old Testament, to introduce them to that Messiah. Some have tried to make an issue of the fact that Paul says the Jews were in Egypt for 450 years when in other places in Scripture it says 400 years. The difference is, which Paul states, the 450 years include the 400 captivity plus the 400 years in the wilderness and 10 years of conquest so what paul is saying when he says 450 years he's talking about how long they were in egypt how long they wandered in the wilderness and how long it took them to settle the land problem solved let's go back to the message brothers sons of the family of abraham and those among you who fear god to us has been sent the message of this salvation For those who live in Jerusalem and the rulers, uh, because they did not recognize him nor understand the, the utterances of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled by them condemning him. 
And though they found in him no guilt worthy of death, they asked Pilate to have him executed. And when they had carried out all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. And for many days he appeared to those who had come up with, uh, with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now his witnesses to the people. And we bring you the good news that God promised to the fathers. This he has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus, as also it is written in the second psalm. You are my son, today I have begotten you. And as for the fact that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption, he has spoken in this way, I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. Therefore he says in another psalm, you will not let your holy one see corruption. For David, after he served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid in, with his fathers and saw corruption but whom God raised up did not see corruption. He's talking about the resurrection of Jesus here. Paul directly blames the Jews for killing Jesus, as did Peter and Stephen. He tells the Jews, the Jewish listeners, that Jesus was seen after his resurrection and testified to by the apostles. Paul quotes from Isaiah 55, 3, in support of the resurrection, as well as Psalm 16, 10, some of the same passages Peter had used in his previous sermons. Paul continues on. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And by him, everyone who believes is freed from everything from which they could not be freed by the law of Moses. We need to stop. It's getting too late. Holy cow. Paul concludes his message with an emphatic statement concerning Jesus providing forgiveness of sins. The pronoun translated as this one is in the emphatic position in the Greek sentence. This means that Paul was saying with emphasis that through Jesus, forgiveness comes to them. Any questions on Paul's sermon? Thank you, Father, for the record you give us in your word of, of messages like this. Reminding us of all that you did to bring Jesus to the cross, to the grave, to the empty grave, to bring us all to salvation. Thank you for that truth. Let us live that truth every day and let us bring that truth to people around us so that we can remind them that Jesus died for us and saved us so that we can be your children. Give us a great time in the service to follow that you might be honored and glorified as we as we worship you and as we study your words some more and as we fellowship together. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for watching or listening to this teaching on demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. Please consider sending us an email at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com to let us know how this teaching may have helped you. Please also consider joining us in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church, located at 10251 Metro Parkway, Suite 116, Fort Myers, Florida just south of the intersection of Metro and Colonial Boulevard. Sunday school begins at 9 and worship service at 10 a.m. We look forward to seeing you in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church.